station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is the station. We are ready for the event. Medscape Cardiology, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Melissa Walton Shirley with Medscape Cardiology. How do you hear me? Hey, Dr. Walton Shirley, hey, welcome Dr. to the International Dr. Space Station. Uh, it's an it's an oh, honor to well, greet you, you and to welcome much. you on behalf of Expedition 69. This is Dr. Melissa Walton Shirley with Medscape, and I'm excited to speak with Dr. Frank Rubio, astronaut and physician, who's coming to us live from the International Space Station. Welcome, Frank, and thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to spend some time with you guys. Uh, I've used uh, Medscape for years, so it's uh, great to, uh, to finally meet you. Thank you so very much. Um, during your now over 200 days in space, has your background as a board-certified family physician and flight surgeon proven useful for your work on the space station? Well, you know, I think having a physician on board always brings a, a sense of uh, kind of peace of mind. Uh, we do have a full medical suite up here and can uh, treat up to including uh, ACLS protocol. Uh, but fortunately, I haven't really had to use many of my medical skills. All of my uh, crewmates are incredibly healthy. Uh, we all tend to stay in pretty good shape. And so it's one of those things that you hope to always be ready for the worst, but hope to never use even the uh, least of our skills up here. That's fantastic. Could you describe some general measures to ensure both good physical and mental health for astronauts in space? Like, what is your daily fitness routine, Frank? Yeah, you know, um, some of the processes that we see in space tend to mimic uh, some of the medical processes that we see uh, in humans as we get older. Uh, and so, but they tend to happen a lot quicker here in space. Uh, some of the major ones being bone loss and uh, muscle density loss. And so we do tend to quite a, uh, spend quite a bit of time doing resistive uh, training, weightlifting essentially, but you can't lift weights in space. And so we use two large pistons to create uh, resistance and every day we do about two hours of uh, fitness routine, about an hour of resistance training, lots of lower body because those uh, femurs produce a vast majority of our blood and um, you know, just uh, also tend to, to suffer the most loss, our hips and femurs. And so we do a lot of uh, lower body exercises, squats, deadlifts, uh, and things like that. And then we spend about 45 minutes on either the treadmill or a stationary bike and uh, to get our cardiovascular workout on every day also. So, um, you know, every day seems like a lot, but because you're not walking around and you're not bearing your weight, your body tends to recover much quicker. And so you're able to work out on a much more consistent basis uh, up here. So also uh, speak to the uh, fitness of, for mental health. Uh, for instance, are you able to communicate with your family on a daily basis? Is there also video and audio capability to sort of give it that feel as if you're closer to home? Yeah, the team does a great job of supporting us on that. Um, you know, every week we have a, a special uh, allotted time to spend with our family, and uh, we call those uh, family conferences. Uh, and we just recently actually started using a video conferencing capability, and that's proven to be a great boost uh, for our mental health. Uh, we stay much more uh, well connected. You know, there's just something about seeing your loved ones on screen versus just uh, hearing them on the phone. Uh, and we can use that uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, we do stay pretty busy up here. You know, we, uh, our work day tends to be about 12 hours, but that includes some meal time and uh, that workout time that we talked about. Uh, but still, uh, most of us try to block out a 10 and 20 minute block to stay in touch with our loved ones uh, almost daily. And so yes, that really does help with our time up here. But we also have a family that's uh, up here in space. We call it our space family. And our crew crewmates, other human beings that I'm up here with, uh, they become some of my uh, best friends. Fortunately, some of them were already some of my best friends. And so it makes it really easy to uh, get along and just have a great time together up here. That's fantastic. Um, some of our readers wanted to know what type of blood tests are performed regularly on astronauts at the space station. Well, quite a bit, right? Uh, we are trying to see uh, and establish a baseline for what the effects on, on 
and the um, physiological um, the physiological effects that space has on humans. Uh, unfortunately, there's not been many astronauts, as you know, uh, for any study to have power. We just need more and more uh, subjects, and so because of that, almost all of us tend to uh, get the full gamut of uh, blood tests while we're up here. Uh, very rarely do those uh, tests get drawn. Uh, they get drawn up here, but they don't really necessarily get run up here. We will tend to send most of our uh, samples back, either frozen uh, or ambient, and then uh, the labs down at NASA uh, will store some of the samples for long-term study and also uh, study them as we go. And so really, almost any test that you can think of, uh, we, we tend to get up here. So um, we know the Artemis project will eventually take humans to Mars. So what do you foresee as the greatest danger to human health during extended and deeper space travel? Yeah, so uh, as always, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, once we leave um, the protective field, the ele protective electromagnetic field that the Earth provides, uh, that exposes us to a tremendous amount of uh, radiation. And the further we get away from Earth, uh, the more that uh, has an effect on us. Uh, so that's probably the number one overall uh, risk factor that we face. Um, microgravity in and of itself obviously provides uh, risk, like we talked about, uh, to our bone health. Uh, and our uh, muscle density uh, health. Uh, isolation, like you uh, alluded to, tends to be a factor for our mental health. Um, and just also, you know, for our loved ones, right, dealing with the risks that we expose ourselves to. I think most of us uh, see this job as a tremendously fun and a great opportunity. Uh, but the reality is that uh, despite all the amazing work that the ground teams do, we are still, uh, we do still face some um, tremendous risks. And so I think uh, it's important for family, families and loved ones to learn how to um, cope with those risks and also for us to um, help them uh, deal with those risks as we travel deeper into space. Uh, so all those things, you know, NASA does an amazing job of just breaking down any risk, whether it's an engineering risk or a medical risk. Uh, we break it down in the smallest uh, blocks possible and uh, mitigate everywhere that we can. And so uh, despite the... Uh, tremendously dangerous environment the that we operate in, uh, the rockets that we work in, and um, you know the places that we go. The reality is it's an incredibly safe job because we have incredible support from the ground teams and the engineering teams that are part of uh, the NASA family. Frank, could you pick one specific future medical benefit that may impact us terrestrials that you might obtain from your work through the International Space Station or even from Artemis, what specific one are you most excited about? Yeah, you know, we're looking at some uh, really cool things recently. Uh, two of the ones that I've been most uh, excited about, uh, we recently had a biofabrication uh, machine up here, and essentially we're looking at 3D printing uh, human tissues. Uh, we're starting with some very basic uh, tissues like meniscus, uh, but eventually the goal would be to use that type of technology to possibly print uh, human organs, right? Uh, the fact that we can do that in microgravity and remove the, effect, the sedimentary effects, uh, the convective effects that um, the environment down on Earth has on those processes, we could possibly uh, produce much higher quality organs. Uh, now, there's still a lot of challenges as far as transportation, both up and down from space, uh, but we're starting to um, you know, slowly make progress towards that uh, real possibility. Uh, the other thing that we look at is uh, crystal growth. And so we're able to manufacture, again, because we are able to remove some of those forces uh, the, that we experience on Earth, uh, we're able to manufacture much higher quality crystals uh, up here in space. And so I think that'll have an effect on the medicines uh, that we can create, much more stable medicines that maybe are more resistant to heat uh, and um, less uh, they see less degradation over time. And I think that'll make uh, much higher quality medicines available to a greater uh, portion of the population down on Earth. Uh, so those type of things are uh, pretty promising for what space can provide, what benefits uh, space can provide for people back on Earth. Well, Frank, we are hopeful you'll be home soon and reunited with your family, friends, and your Earthbound colleagues. I want to thank you so very much for your service to our country and more accurately for your service to humanity. This is Dr. Melissa Walton Shirley signing off for Medscape.
Dr. Walton Shirley, it was an honor. Thank you so much for your time. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. To conclude the Medscape cardiology portion of the event, please stand by for a voice check from KDKA TV. This is so cool. Station, this is Heather Abraham with KDKA. How do you hear me? Heather, this is Woody Hoberg. I have you loud and clear. This is cool. This is so, I mean, cooler for you because you're actually in space. Yeah, it's great to be here, Heather, and an honor to get to talk with you. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Expedition 69 crew. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. So is this a dream come true for you, Woody? This is definitely a dream come true for me. Like, like I think many children, uh, when I was growing up, being an astronaut sounded like just the coolest job in the world. Honestly, I never thought it was actually possible. Uh, and it wasn't really until I was, uh, honestly, until I got the call telling me I had actually been selected that I actually believed that it was possible to get this job. But it's absolutely a, a dream come true. So do you, are you missing home? Are you missing Pittsburgh? Because I can tell you it's just another cloudy, rainy day here. That's funny. I actually noticed this morning that we were flying directly over Pittsburgh, and I thought I would go outside and get some uh, photos of, of Pittsburgh as we flew over. And like you say, it was uh, completely socked in with clouds. But I will say, I, I definitely, um, it's an honor to be up here, and I, I'm just loving my time on board. Couldn't be happier. But I also, every time I look back at Earth, I think, wow, it's, that's a special place that I look forward to returning to. Wow. Um, when you say that you were going to go outside to take pictures, what does that mean when you're an astronaut? Well, I may have, uh, I think what I meant is look outside. So uh, okay. typically uh, we, <laughs> when we, when we want to photograph Earth, we have a couple windows actually that are that are great for um, Earth observations. We have the cupola, which provides a sort of panoramic view of, of Earth. It's really incredible to spend time in there. And then we also have an Earth viewing window uh, looking straight down in the U.S. laboratory, and that's a higher quality, like photo grade window that's uh, great for taking photos. We actually use that for. Um, some science missions involving photography, and also for uh, occasionally there are international disaster charter sites. So for example, if there's a hurricane somewhere on Earth, we're sometimes some of the uh, first photos that can get taken are astronauts on the space station just pointing a camera at what's going on. It's wonderful. Um, is there anything that you're missing from back home? Oh, look at the microphone just floating. <laughs> I miss showers. <laughs> I'm a mom to three, so I miss showers too, Woody. <laughs> um, all of your experience, I watched this wonderful video that NASA put together of you, um, and it included an interview with you too, of your experience leading up to this moment, um, from childhood up until the point that you left. Um, what do you think? about the preparation that went into this and, and kind of like your lifelong buildup to get to where you are. Yeah, look, I've had this discussion a lot with my classmates, classmates and colleagues in the astronaut office and at NASA. And I think a common thread for everyone is the realization that the careers we were all pursuing prior to becoming astronauts were ones that we were just incredibly passionate about and that uh, we, we actually didn't know in the moment that that was a pathway to becoming an astronaut. So the, the sort of wi wandering road that I've taken professionally, um, everything from engineering to flying airplanes to search and rescue, um, all of that was just pursuing passions and, and I didn't, there's no right way to become an astronaut and it was only in hindsight when I was applying and, and going through the process to get the job that I realized that my background was actually well suited um, for, 
for being an astronaut? Yeah, I mean, when I when I watched that video, I mean, not many people can say that when they were kids, they were building rockets. Um, and even being part of the search and rescue team at Yosemite, I mean, getting lost in the wilderness is kind of like being up in space. You're just kind of out there and, and searching for the next frontier. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of those early memories building rockets were right there in Pittsburgh uh, with an organization called Tripoli Pittsburgh. It's an amateur rocketry group. Uh, I, I'm indebted to them for um, just kind of molding me, honestly, as an engineer in my early years. And then later on, yeah, I think I've always found that I'm really passionate about technical things like engineering, but then also operational things. And that's what drove me to get involved in search and rescue and flying. And I think that's a common thread in human space flight. You know, we do really technical stuff up here on the space station, but we also have to make stuff happen every day operationally. And the team in mission control helps us do that every day. And for people that kind of enjoy both aspects of that, this is, uh, this is a really special place. I have a really random question if it's allowed. Is it cold? I actually, I've heard some people feel cold. Um, different parts of the space station are slightly colder than others. And actually, the place that I um, shower after my workouts is one of the cold places. So that, that's always entertaining. Um, but honestly, it's, it's a, on average, it's like a balmy 72 degrees anywhere you go on the space station uh, every day of the year. So uh, speaking of the space station, what are you doing there? What is your goal? What is your mission while you're there? Well, big picture, we are, I'm really honored to be carrying on uh, the incredible more than 22 year legacy of continued continuous human presence on board the space station. So that's just amazing. In the last more than 22 years, there has not been a moment when we don't have humans on board the ISS living and working. And that's exactly what we're continuing to do as part of Expedition 69. Uh, we've been busy. We just sent home a uh, SpaceX cargo vehicle, the SpaceX 27 mission, full of science results that we spent about the last month working on. And now we're gearing up for uh, the first EVA in our increment. So we're going to um, gear up to send my colleagues Steve Bowen and Sultan Al-Nayadi outside the space station to do some repair work, and that'll be uh, next week. So we're, we're always busy um, doing a number of different things up here. That's wild. I couldn't imagine doing repair work outside in space, floating out there. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to disclose, but when do you come back home? Well, right now we're targeting somewhere around uh, late August. We're always prepared for these dates to change. Uh, it could be earlier, it could be later, uh, but somewhere around late summer, early fall is the target right now. Have you heard from North Allegheny? I, they must be so proud that you're a graduate from their school. Yeah, I'm so lucky that I got got to uh, attend such a wonderful public school. Um, you know, all through high school, uh, North Allegheny was was a really positive uh, portion of my early development, and uh, I am hoping to get to talk with the students there a little bit later uh, this spring. I also have a, a brother. Uh, my brother Russ teaches high school chemistry, tenth grade chemistry at Upper Saint Clair, uh, so I'm hoping to maybe talk with his school as well at some point this spring. Well, I hope you can visit us at KDKA when you're uh, back here on Earth and showered. I know that'll be one of the first things you do. <laughs> that would and be best you. for both of us, and I would absolutely <laughs> right. love that. I would uh, love to come visit sometime. <laughs> Thank you so much, Woody, and congratulations on all your success. Thank you, Heather. It was great speaking with you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants from Medscape Cardiology and KDKA TV. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Station, copy. Thank you.